This is David McCall, host of the QTS Experience podcast. This week, I asked Dr. Brendan Engelet to join me for a discussion on artificial intelligence and how it might impact what he calls dull, dirty, or dangerous jobs. For example, can we create rescue machines that enter a burning house or a collapsing building to come and save us? Or perhaps a diver that enters the extremely dangerous waters around a Navy ship to inspect and clean the hull? Or maybe could we create construction worker to supplement roadside construction crews that aren't in harm's way of moving vehicles? You get the idea. Our discussion did not venture into the very important topic of job displacement. That's coming soon with my guest, Martin Ford. Today, I'm more interested in how close are we to this reality and what's involved in teaching machines, well, how to act human. Dr. Englott, is an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Stevens Institute of Technology. He has over 15 years of experience developing and deploying mobile robots and autonomous navigation systems. He's the founder and director of the Robust Field Autonomy Lab, and he received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I think you're gonna enjoy the conversation, so join us on the QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one, Dr. Brendan Inglet. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up at Stevens and how you got interested in this work? Sure. Um, so I uh, did my graduate studies at MIT. And um, during that time, uh, I, I spent several years working with underwater robots. Uh, we were trying to equip an underwater robot with all of the capabilities needed to perform a fully autonomous um, in-water ship hull inspection for the U.S. Navy. I'm sorry, and in the what? course of Oh, uh, sorry. What'd you say? A wet inspection? Uh, ship hull inspection. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because this is a task that divers, actually Navy divers spend a lot of time doing this task right. and it's dangerous and it's time consuming. And uh, the goal was to see if a robot could perform that task instead and do it reliably and, and efficiently. So in the course of trying to solve a problem like that, you know, um, me and my colleagues got introduced to a lot of really tough problems in autonomy uh, that have inspired, you know, what I've done in probably the whole decade since then. Right. And um, I also got to know Stevens through my time working with maritime applications with underwater robotics. Uh, Stevens Institute of Technology has been around a long time uh, and it has had a kind of a historic presence in that domain. So uh, it seemed like a great place to go next to kind of continue that work and also to team up with the faculty working across all the different areas of AI, um, not just in maritime applications, but uh, you know more broadly all throughout robotics as well. As you're describing sort of your background and getting in, in well, robotics touches a lot of things. Um, artificial intelligence uh, touches pretty much everything. And I'm curious, when you think about this, for example, the whole ship, uh, the ship hull inspection, how do you how do you go about creating a device to um, not so much to withstand the pressure? I mean, that's mechanical engineering, that's engineering, but to make decisions on what to inspect, where to inspect, and what does um, you know what is good or acceptable mean? And before you answer that, this is what I mean. Have you ever seen that movie um, Trouble with the Curve by Clint Eastwood? I haven't. I've seen a lot of Clint Eastwood movies, but not that one. <laughs> well, it, 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 and then there's another movie, and I think there's a uh, connection here called Moneyball. Do you ever see the movie Moneyball yes. with Beretta? Uh -huh. Okay. And so the, the premise that they talk about is more than an algorithm, there are baseball people or sport people or whatever. And in some spots in the movie, the algorithms win. And in some spots of the movie, the people win, like their intuition, you know, and of course it's Hollywood eyes. So we, we write it to the audience, but I'm curious. I've got to believe that Navy divers that have not only extensive training, but extensive experience, they have an instinct. How do you impart that to a machine? That's a great question. 
And I'll, I'll first off, probably an easy one too. It, well, well, <laughs> I'll tell you that, uh, you know, th that's a, such a hard question to answer that, you know, at the end of my PhD, there's probably, there was, you know, a decade or two worth of additional questions to answer after that. Cause I, I don't think we got close to replicating the, you know, the intelligence, um, of a Navy diver or their familiarity or dexterity in that problem setting where they have years of experience, but, right. but there's potential. Right. And I think robotics and especially ro the intersection of robotics and AI is so exciting because robots can be, you know, the physical embodiment for artificial intelligence. You know, they're, they're the body into which you're putting this, this brain. And um, there's a lot of exciting potential there, but still also a long <clears throat> excuse me, a long way to go. Right. And we learn how long a way there is to go from our experiences, you know, working for several years, trying to develop a robot that could replicate what that Navy diver was doing because it needed to do it much more slowly. It had to see the world in a very different way. Uh, it needed to process its data in a very different way. And um, seeing the ways that we succeeded and the ways that that project came up short has kind of inspired my uh, my research and our goal to make fewer assumptions about the world around us when we try to put that robot into complex situations. Hopefully that robot doesn't need a perfect model of the ship. You know, hopefully it doesn't need to know exactly which way the wind is blowing, which way the currents are flowing in the water. And our goal is to be able to put it into complex and uncertain situations with less and less of that prior knowledge and have it be able to perform its mission capably, so. Yeah, I you know, I. Um, I started laughing when I had a conversation the other day with somebody about decision making and um, robots or machines or um, uh, artificial intelligence. I have three daughters, um, pray for me, all in their early 20s. And when they go to school, for example, and somebody wants to teach them how to build a bridge, they don't argue with the professor or their textbook about the geometry of the arch or the anchoring points or the distance or whatever. And so in some ways they're able to leverage the, um, the data, the history, the experiences of the entire world, at least to the degree that we can capture it, record it, and then uh, represent it in a way that people, human beings can digest it. Um, so they have to learn it. They do. They argue all the time with their parents about, you know, these are mistakes I made. You shouldn't do this. You should save this, spend that, or whatever. That brings no value to them. But they can study this uh, engineering idea or biology idea or whatever. Um, but there is a there's a learning curve there. I'm wondering when you think of a machine, the first machine. It has right two one the data that's already been gathered that you have to impart to it and two some sort of I'm imagining sensory or, or experiential um, you know especially if we're talking about a robot getting in so you've got it data we fed into you now this is what it quote unquote feels like this is what it quote unquote looks like this is what the experience you know your sensory inputs do, do the machines because the next student that comes in behind assuming they have a similar intellectual level, they is assuming they have a certain similar vocabulary, these students are going to assimilate and learn at about the same pace. A freshman is going to learn like the other freshman before it and the sophomore, not, not counting outliers. When you have a robot or a machine, is it the same thing or does the machine that come next comes next starts off faster, quicker, than the one that went before because it's able to, without arguing, assume the previous data and just move? Well, yeah, that's a great question. And I'd say that, that achieving that is one of the goals of AI research is to you know make, make it such that the next machine that comes along or the next robot that gets introduced into that environment has some data and some knowledge that it could start from. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that can come from taking an AI system and training it on a large database that might not have a, a lot to do with your specific problem setting, but it allows it to get started. And then from that, you can do some additional training built that builds on top of it. That's a little more domain specific. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you can kind of think of it that way. Our, one of our goals is to kind of allow new systems to be introduced and, you know, understand what's going on very quickly. 
And in fact, one, one recent piece of work I, I've done with my PhD students at Stevens has been um, what we call zero shot learning, where we try to introduce a system that's already been trained uh, into an environment it's never seen before. You know, it's seen relevant data, it's right. seen similar kinds of environments, but it's never been in this environment. We introduced it there for the first time and it takes everything it learned and just tries to apply it and we see how well it gets it right. Um, and we actually, and many others in, in robotics uh, as well have been um, showing that this is possible, done all the training inside a simulator. Then for the very first time you turn on the real robot and you see if the hardware has learned enough from the simulator that can actually apply the same principles in the real world. And sometimes it works. So we're, we're starting to build an understanding of when that works and when it doesn't. And uh, it's a very powerful enabler for robots and uh, autonomous systems. I've seen deep sea um, remote control robots with a human at the joystick operating them. And when that human being gets a new robot or a new machine can go to greater depths, stronger, longer battery or whatever, um, if it's the if it's the same operator, the only thing they have to learn essentially is the constraints of this new thing I'm connected to. Mm -hmm. um, that's an extension of my will, but my experience that I've built up over twenty or thirty years of searching for the Titanic or doing hole inspections or whatever, I I bring that. It seems to me the real breakthrough would be. Um, both, that I could take the quote unquote brain at a robot one that could operate in a current like this and a temperature like this at a depth like this. But now we're 10 years in with advances in materials and propulsion and battery and et cetera. And I can still bring that brain or that experience that has elastic, it can learn, it can whatever, but it gets a new body, a new shell, um, new and improved, and is allowed to you know, carry all that forward. Is that, um, how realistic is that? Or is that a pretty big fantasy? Well, I can tell you that we're still at a point where humans can do that way more effectively than machines can. You know, the ability to uh, extrapolate, right? right? Take the knowledge and experience you've gained, go into a new problem setting and apply it in, a, in an environment you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, that one of the biggest goals, you know, at the intersection of robotics and machine learning is to try to equip robots so that they can do that. Um, but we're, you know, we have a long way to go. We're still trying to build an understanding of how to do that in domains that really differ quite substantially, like, you know, that, that a, hu a well-trained human expert would be capable of doing. Mm. Um, so there's, there's still a long way to go there. Yeah. But, you know, one, one example is we, we try to build robustness to those kind of changes by, Doing things we, you know, doing things to randomize the domain in which the robot is learning. Like for example, maybe you just unintentionally introduced all of the training data from an environment that has a certain color of walls in the background. Suddenly, the robot sees a data data where the walls are blue instead of white, and it doesn't know what to do. Right. So, um, robot. That's kind of an example, I guess, of how machines don't learn quite in the same way that humans do. You know, that some weird little thing like that, what some weird little discrepancy could throw the system off because it doesn't know what the most important part of the scene is that it's learning from necessarily, you know? Um, so trying to endow robots and machines with that kind of understanding, like I'm seeing all this data, what's the most important part of this data? Uh, you know, what, what, what do I really want to take away from this and, and reduce it down to kind of the key, uh, you know, what are the key takeaways from, from all this data that I'm seeing? Um, that's an area that's, that's still an ongoing area of research and we have a long way to go. That's such a great perspective. Sometimes I get, maybe intimidated is not the right word, but a little anxious when I listen to the risks, not just the potentials, but the risk with machines, doing machine, deci machine decisions. We'll come to that in a moment. But I, I am regularly reminded, and you just did it again, that these devices have no frame of reference where for you and I, in the same way they have no ethic, they have, it's like the hammer. The hammer's not aware of the wind. The hammer's not, it's just a hammer. Um, it, it knows to strike. It doesn't know it's a nail or a thumb or whatever. It just knows to strike and that's what it does. And it's, there's nothing good or bad inherent in that. It's a tool. Um, but when you're describing um, that scenario of it's a blue wall, for you and I, we recognize 
what is a wall, what's the function of a wall, regardless of its color. We may even subconsciously think that's a sturdy wall or it's a um, effective wall or whatever, but, but we're not intimidated. We know this is a wall. Um, I, it reminded me of uh, a book I'm rereading. This is where my super nerdness comes out. And it's about this guy who is a, uh, a night elf. So anybody that's fans of 80s high fiction, his name was uh, Drizzt. And Drizzt great is, grows up in the underground caverns of this particular place. And when he leaves his home and goes out into the upper world, right, he, it, the author does a really good, R.A. Salvatore does a really good job of kind of describing this entire different world that um, this super intelligent um, person has no experience with and has to figure out how to navigate. Weird analogy, I know, but that's my brain. But I'm, I'm thinking of this device that we put in um, into environments, um, and it's 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 got to to your point earlier. It's got to extrapolate certain things. Is this something to be worried about? Is this something that tells me, "Oop, I need to stop and phone home," or I can continue on with my mission? So, how do you? That takes me to decision making. How is it when you experiment? What's the goal of decision making, and how do you take tell a machine to um, to make decisions and and the framework? in which that you do that. This is, mm-hmm. a, this is a good decision. This is a better or best decision. This is a catastrophic decision. How do you think through that? Yeah, so much of it still comes from a human designer, where at this point, you know, the human is not designing the solution to the problem the same way they may have done decades ago, but instead they're designing kind of the reward function, you know, that governs the, the robot or AI system's behavior and you know, incentivizes it to uh, mimic the desired behavior. Mm. And so um, what, you know, what machines are learning still derives to a large extent from those, those rules that are set in place by the AI or robot system designer. Um, you know, one of our goals is also to, to be able to develop systems that can um, eventually make decisions without that kind of guidance. There is a lot of really active research and progress in areas called um, unsupervised learning and self-supervised learning where robots kind of just get an AI systems, just get lots of data thrown at them and have to make sense of the data on their own. But to get to decision making, it's very hard without some structure imposed by a human designer. And usually we have to impose what is that reward function? You know, what are the rules of the game and how do you score points? We have to tell the system how the points are scored. And only based on the rules we write, you know, is it is it learning what matters, right? Um, whether it's the colors of the walls or whether it's the object that's sitting on the table, understanding that comes from the rules that we write for the system. Right. Now, humans, we're supposed to have rules, too. Like if I go drive my car, there are rules. Um, there's rewards for success. There's um, consequences for failure, um, whether that's as simple as you know, my gas mileage and how I'm driving my vehicle or, um, punitive, you know, you, you, um, you exceeded a speed limit or you hurt somebody or you hurt some property or whatever. And, and so we have that, but we've agreed upon a community, whether it's at the international level, a federal level, a state level, right. All the way down to our neighborhood HOA or whatever, we've agreed upon a set of rules, how do you how do you in this area agree upon a set of rules so that you can turn around and impart it to um, a machine? You know, it's challenging, and I think it depends a lot on the problem setting. You know, in the world of academic research, I think we're still setting very simple rules just to test and push the boundaries of this technology and see what kind of problems it can solve. And maybe there's just one simple analytical function we can write that says, here's how points are, you know, here's how the robot scores points. Um, But when you get into real world tasks, things like autonomous driving, you know, there are so many real world rules that have to be followed. It becomes a lot more complex and the decisions probably have to be aware of all of those rules, you know, in order to, to emulate human behavior. Yeah. I, I, it's been introduced to me a number of times, the level of complexity that you and I don't even think about when we make decisions because we've just sort of we've over time been indoctrinated and i don't mean that in the negative context of the word we've just our systems have observed um 
how the world operates around us, good or bad. We've observed these things. We've made certain value judgments. Um, some have been very explicit. If I'm a professional soldier, I have a Geneva Convention, international treaties, the UN. I have the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I have the rules of my branch of service, my training, all these things. And then, you know, those are sort of the, the ideas. Those are the boundaries. And then I operate with two um, overriding sort of themes, accomplish the mission and troop welfare. That's sort of my thing within those boundaries. At least that's the goal. Is We know it does not always go that way, but that's the goal. But there's so much in that's unstated, that's assumed. And the illustration that somebody gave me once was um, you could tell a machine, for example, hey, we need to eradicate cancer. And probably a simple, um, you know, a, a, this is a simple analogy. And the machine says, great, kills all the humans. Cancer's gone. Wait, that's not what we meant. <laughs> that's not what we meant. Well, cancer's gone. I, I, where's my reward? You know, I, I did that. Do you set up such extreme boundaries when you're trying to teach it and then work into nuance or it almost seems like it's poetry right first you got to teach people the language this essentials of a language and you work towards things like poetry and nuance and music and you know whatever some people instinctually get it uh, most of us me at the forefront despite our great enthusiasm have no skill at that but I, I'm, I'm curious, how do you get a poet laureate or a whatever out of a machine? Because um, that seems like that's the goal is I want something that has nuance, that can flourish in and around other human beings, does no harm, and accomplishes these tasks with joy, for lack of a better word, that we assign to it. So, yeah, there's a lot of different views on this. And I guess my perspective is I try to gravitate toward the problems where we need robots and AI systems to make decisions because those problems are very hard even for humans to solve. And perhaps the rate of reliability of, of making a good decision uh, will go up. You like know, if, if, you, if you let the machine learn from tons and tons of data that humans themselves aren't able to process. Because I, I'll admit there are certain domains where we already know the best way to do something or have a very effective way of doing something. And you, you put a machine next to a human expert and by comparison, uh, you know, it's not even close. Right. Uh, and, and a kind of a fun example you can see some videos online of is trying to teach a humanoid robot how to walk. Right. If you reward it just by staying up and not falling down, you're not telling it anything about the type of gait that it needs to walk stably. You're going to get all kind of weird rambling, you know, gates that all that look very, very different because you haven't provided enough detail. Right. I would instead try to steer AI systems toward problems that you know, we we don't know how to solve, like, you know, analyzing medical imagery and trying to correctly diagnose a condition based on that imagery from right. training on millions and millions of images that, you know, even the best of human experts uh, is not able to process when they're making their decision. So, right. you know, I think there's there's different realms of decision making where AI and robotics can be more useful than others. Do you get intimidated when you think about or concerned when you think about, hey, at some point, not Stevens Institute, but a nation state maybe that is not friendly towards us or um, has a different goal than, um, you know, whatever, P pick a group, you know, that group has a different goal than this group. And I'm going to use um, AI or machines, robots to uh, give me a competitive advantage or, a, um, in, in, you know, whether it's as simple as, because we use technology all the time to give us a competitive advantage in um, pretty much any industry that we, uh, that we do. I want the strings on my guitar to be a little bit better than the string, you know, whatever. I mean, fill in the blank. <clears throat> but it feels like that the potential of devices making decisions uh, at some point in the future that could affect human beings directly or indirectly has the potential to be pretty, to, to be exponentially greater than just um, some of the, you know, the technology we've used today. So when you think about that, how do you how do you and your researchers bring in this idea of we wanted to make good decisions, but we also want the global community, the international community, to be aligned on what a good decision is, on where where the boundary of a machine stops and a human being takes over, or um, or is that really not part of your research? 
Well, I guess, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've, we've tried to gravitate toward problems where there is a compelling unmet societal need and they're pro and these are problems that are very difficult for humans to solve or potentially just dangerous right. for humans to be in a situation where they have to solve that problem um but i mean you're right there is a lot of responsibility that goes with turning over decision making to a machine right um even when something is trained and uh, you know maybe is equipped with the best ai system in existence I think most researchers would be of the opinion that there still needs to be some human oversight and human supervision in the loop, um, even if a system is making its own decisions. You know, it right. may just change the way that humans interact with machines and put that human in an even higher supervisory role than they used to be. You know, and um, I guess that's probably one of the most important responsibilities we as researchers have is to understand and propose you know, ways that humans can interact with these machines so that they can be deployed safely, used safely, and, um, you know, have, have an appropriate level of oversight. Right. I, I think they're always going to, they're going to need human oversight, just in a different way than we've traditionally thought of them. Right. Um, how are you imagining, we've talked about inspecting ship holes, which seems a fantastic use of technology to me. What are some of the other applications you think about that really captured your imagination? Yeah, the, there are um, a variety of applications um, in different domains where having these capabilities just um, permits a, a human to spend their time and, and, and energy and you know scarce right. resources doing something that's the highest possible priority. So I think our, my research has largely focused on those kind of, what, what in robotics we often call the dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks. Um, that we'd really like to keep humans away from if we can help it. Um, right. Things like uh, subsea, um, subsea construction, subsea oil and gas production, anything that requires you to dive down thousands of feet. If we could save a person from having to do that and put their life at risk and just have intelligent machines, you know, uh, do it instead, yeah. that would be great. Uh, it would be nice to get to a point where perhaps all construction and decommissioning of underwater structures happen with just the aid of robotic systems so that no one had to dive down, you know, 5,000 feet to the very bottom of the Gulf of Mexico to do it. Um, we've thought about it in other domains too, uh, where robotic ground vehicles can perform um, inspection, patrolling, security, surveillance, essentially, you know, playing the role of a security guard and um, searching for anomalies in places where um, inspection is important. Mm -hmm. We've looked at one example is electric substations where mm -hmm. there are many uh, and our, you know, our grid is severely stressed and mm -hmm. anomalous things happen all the time. Freight insulation, escaping, you know, unintentional escapage of uh, electrical energy and having robots just kind of patrolling around, keeping an eye on that situation is, is very helpful. Yeah. Um, patrolling the environment and, uh, you know, monitoring the, the kind of health and state of the environment, um, trawling the depths of the ocean where it's very, very costly to send people or even to send um, vehicles to collect observations. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of exciting applications like that, that those are the ones that, I, that I'm particularly motivated by, the ones that uh, send robots to places that are hard for people to go and to help keep people out of harm's way. I, there are, gosh, there's so many, we don't have enough time to get into it, but there's a number that caught my imagination here in Georgia, uh, one of the prettiest places to live in the country, but we have a lot of really tall pine, 60 foot, 70 foot pine trees. And these things are beautiful and interesting until an ice storm comes through, which we get about every five years or so. And then they fall over everything or the occasional, we're not particularly susceptible to tornadoes, but we do get them on occasion. But in any event, <clears throat> almost every year, certainly every two to three years, we have a significant outage here. I'm sure other parts of the country have their own um, issues. But as you're describing an opportunity for machines to come alongside human beings and help in what I've labeled over here, the D-cube jobs, uh, dull, dirty, and dangerous. But imagine putting a, a, a group of um, robots on or machines with a first response truck to um, run up that pole to get the trees off of the line that have you know specialized equipment that are 
insulated and whatever, and they have hydraulics to, to move things, just that first response to get the grid back up, to get the hospitals uh, reconnected. Um, you were talking about, we've talked a lot about robots in the water, underwater. Um, my industry, the data center industry, um, we work a lot with the undersea cable providers. <clears throat> Super important now, not just the laying of cables, but the maintaining of cables, the security of cables, because data is the most, I think it's, it's the commodity of the whole world today, um, how we make so many decisions. And so to have a regular patrol of these things bef before there's a failure or before something interferes with them, and you've got devices that can do that and give you real-time uh, data would be fascinating to me. I am curious, though, that seems to introduce, or, or even last thing is fire. I grew up out west. Fires just, uh, regardless of the source, the power grid out there is aging, it explodes, um, this, uh, Santa Anita winds can come in and dry everything out before you know it, you know, a spark for any reason. And to be able to have first responders that can get in there and lay down fire return uh, material or dig a trench or, you know, just so many cool applications I could see in, in, um, in these things. But in those environments, it is, while you may remove fear, how do you navigate? Like, I'm curious to know how these things um, can operate in those worlds when the environment's constantly changing. If a blue wall can throw them off, how do you help them navigate where they're making, um, you know, good decisions and in a constantly changing environment? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, the examples you provided, I think those motivate a lot of researchers around the world. The idea of having robots as first responders or assistants to first responders that can be enabled by AI systems to step into harm's way before a person has to be put right. into harm's way. You know, that's motivating all of us to try to solve these really hard decision making problems. Just imagine the 9-11 towers, if you had a, a suite of devices. I mean, I, I hate to think of that tragedy, but human beings, but human beings, what we do sometimes, unfortunately, that it's probably not the last time uh, a human caused disaster will happen. But if you had a, a number of devices that had the ability to detect sounds or see thermal Im imagery and could go in and rescue one, you're not putting the rescuers lives um, in as much danger as they um, were put in, and we lost many of them. But the ability to move and shift things at the power of a machine, that to me seems the very, you know, these are some of the best ways we can apply this tech. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. And I would say they all, they're also really hard problems, and they're, you know, they're at the cutting edge right now, but we're trying to prove just through proof of concept that we can do. Right. Um, and one of the big challenges, as you alluded to, is that, Situational awareness is hindered by the mm. by the, the settings in which we need first responders. Right. Uh, a fire where you're in a smoke filled area and visibility is very poor. The lighting conditions are always changing. Um, those kind of situations are hard, and there's there's a navigation piece to that. Um, and I guess there's also the the fact that these are always going to be new situations that an AI system probably has never been exposed to exactly that situation before. So that idea of being able to transfer what you've learned, extrapolate to a new setting um, is especially important there. So, right. you know, that's a, that's a really compelling application where it could make a difference. Um, we, we try to work on that whole set of problems, trying to help use AI to give robots better situational awareness when they have limited kind of corrupted field of view, the, the quality of their sensors is poor. We want to understand how they can kind of enhance that. Um, some, you know, some uh, machine learning techniques focus on how to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How to kind of, uh, kind of like in a movie where you see the person just continually zoom in on a grainy camera image and they, right. they magically see what what's hidden. Um, trying to teach AI systems how to make that kind of inference, we can do that if we have enough examples. So, you you perhaps could learn from situations where you collect data in smoke-filled rooms or in underwater environments with poor visibility and low water clarity. Um, and then eventually you can teach them how to do that enhancement reliably. Um, and then there's the, the decision-making piece as well, where I think there's a lot, of pro a lot of hope behind trying to build higher fidelity simulators that are going to allow us to capture these kinds of situations. Already we're seeing amazing progress made in teaching 
teaching robots how to make decisions in a simulator that mm -hmm. captures that kind of disaster environment, captures it with very high fidelity, and you can simulate all of those horrible situations you never want to have to really be present right. in, but the robot can go through those scenarios and try to learn from them. Right. Well, we, sim you know, we, uh, the insurance institutes uh, simulate horrible situations when they test cars and they, you know, we, we don't ever want to see this happening, but law and law enforcement simulates responding to everything from a, um, a shooting incident to a traffic accident or, or whatever. And so they're, you know, that's, that's not new. And, you know, it seems like the, the training gets more sophisticated as the training moves along, it becomes more sophisticated by introducing less data and still expecting you to come to the optimal outcome. How do you simulate that in a in a lab for a machine? Yeah, that that's a great question. These are the, <laughs> these are kind of like the edge cases, like the, um, the I guess you know there are the right there are the known unknowns that you can try <laughs> to simulate, but then how do you prepare yourself for the unknown unknowns that you might encounter the very first time? You know, that's like a one in ten million situation that the robot only sees that particular disaster. Right. Um, that's that's a really hard problem, and you know one of the one of the ways to try to approach that is just to expose the robot to as many relevant situations as possible and hope that it can extrapolate. But you know, it's, it's not going to be guaranteed that it will. Right. Um, hopefully, you know, through gathering data on things like, you know, the frequency and type of accidents that occur on roadways with road vehicles, we can kind of introduce simulations of those things and prepare robots and AI systems to deal with them. But there are always yeah. going to be some unknown unknowns and uh, those Is are going to be hard to deal with. It's funny how, I'm sure somebody told me this, we expect machines to be 100% accurate, but human beings, we don't. Um, we, you know, we have this notion of um, fatigue. We have this notion of distraction. And, and I don't mean in a way that uh, um, you shouldn't be distracted. So, for example, I'm driving and I... I, it appears to me a woman in a baby carriage is right there. And so I, I, I start to swerve and it distracts me. And when I look back up, I have an accident and I cause great harm over here. And when you go in front of the court, it's not uncommon. The court, you know, you're able to introduce, look, this, any reasonable person in this situation would have had this response because it startled them. Or this was the, the, you know, our fight or flight, our brains are, you know, they're prehistoric brains and this is what they do. And it saved them against a saber tooth, but it caused a crash into this situation because of these other things. And yet with the machine, we were like, no, 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 no. You had two milliseconds. That allowed you to run through 500,000 things to make the correct decision. And you, you know, when, when you do that, I got to imagine that, um, that is a significant challenge because with human beings, we have a little bit of uh, wiggle room, maybe not much, but some, the human part of us, whereas with machine, we are we want perfection. Yeah, it's true. I think there is a, a societal expectation that machines being introduced into these roles will be flawless, will be accident free. Um, they have the potential, of course, to reduce the rates of accidents happening by tremendous amounts, but... Right will still inevitably be involved in accidents. And um, I, it's probably gonna continue to be a very long journey to understanding what needs to happen for there to be some societal acceptance and trust in this technology um, with the understanding that there will inevitably be some failures and accidents that occur, even yeah. if at low, at low rates, still at non-zero rates. Right. It's, um, I mean, the world obviously believes in it. There's, I've. I'm not in the industry, that industry, but I have heard more people talk about the investment that they are putting, starting with decision-making and artificial intelligence, but then how, where do we apply that? Once we have decision-making, how do we get it, whether it's into machines that can, that can take the decision into the world um, through the form of a robot or a, a machine that is... Um, not necessarily a robot. When I think of a robot, I think of everything from Boston Dynamics to, you know, a device inspecting ship holes, for example, or a device like a, um, um, 
uh, on airplanes, you've got the, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, the autopilot, right, that can literally land the plane, take off the plane, like in everything that a human being can do, make decisions. They've really, because it's a very narrow, specific, focused thing that we have so much data on, on how to do, and millions of incidents um, accruing in databases that are being evaluated. And so they're spectacularly accurate, as accurate, probably arguably much more accurate than any human beings um, have been over their lifetime. So it's really interesting area. So obviously the world's bought into this. I, when you look at it and you're talking to um, your students that are coming in, what are some of the ways that's really capturing your imagination, that your research and the future of your research? And, and my, I guess the second part of my question is, does it feel like it's on a curve? Like we're building up exponential speed. It took us this many years to get to this sort of level of decision making and these materials to be able to put them in a robot, to put them into the field. But now costs are coming down or, or not, but, but the data is being built. We're c- collaborating with other institutions and it just feels like we're on a, on a rocket ship up. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, you know, the first part of your comments to respond to that, I would say that we've come to accept different, you know, many different types of automation that we've all come to an agreement on are very successful that make our lives safer, that allow people to move from one place to another more efficiently. Uh, you know, things like autopilots and commercial airplanes and automated rail systems and things like that. And I think one way we might need to eventually evolve our expectations societally is to begin to think of what we call in robotics unstructured tasks um, being automated in a very similar way, right? Where this type of decision making we've been discussing is going to eventually be the equivalent of just driving at the right speed profile down that monorail track and stopping at every station at the right time. Um, We're just going to have automated and autonomous systems doing that in more complex environments that have less structure, that have objects and people moving all around that have to be navigated and and avoided and dealt with. But um, I think eventually just automation is going to be able to deal with those kind of situations and we'll, we'll probably gravitate toward accepting it the same way we, we accept so many other types of automation. Um, as far as the future and the curve at which this is all happening, I guess one, one key thing in robotics that's a little different, that makes it a little bit different from Moore's law, you know, is that we're still, the systems that we're trying to uh, embody with AI are still governed by the laws of physics. You know, they still right. are subject to uh, power constraints. You know, they still weigh a lot. You know, they and, and they still um, need a lot of a lot of energy to move, and also have to, you know we have to have an awareness of exactly how they're interacting with the environment around them. So I think they're going to evolve in the same way that we've seen, you know, vehicle technologies evolve. Right? Like we have not been able to cut in half the time it takes us to fly from New York to Tokyo. Right. Uh, you know, the same way that we've been able to do with um, computer processing. Right. And so I think ro- robots are going to evolve in, in the same way. It's, it's going to be a little sluggish, but just kind of continued progress toward being able to automate many of these unstructured tasks. So far, um, we've, at least it seems to me in our conversation, a lot of the things that we've imagined, let me say it differently, a lot of the ways I imagine these machines being deployed, at least in the near future, whether it's search and rescue or the the dull, dirty, dangerous jobs we've talked about is, <clears throat> you know, a municipality or a government or a, an organization owns those things or manages those things, um, you know, and so many of the ways that we've thought about when does it become consumer level? For example, I want a, a guard dog or, or that the equivalent of that, right? I want something that is... Um, um, in my home or is mowing my lawn or it's it's affordable, it's easily repairable, it's not just the super wealthy, it's pretty much every day people can have something like that. Um, I can get it at Home Depot or whatever, right? When, how far away are we from something in a very narrow specific role? And I'm not talking about the Roomba, which is only good for my main coon to ride around my kitchen. It just pushes dirt from one side to the other. It's her autonomous vehicle. She sits on it 
It doesn't accomplish very much. But I mean, in all seriousness, something that is a maybe not super dangerous, but a dull job, a dirty job, cleaning out the junk from underneath my crawl space, the garbage that accumulates there, the um, cleaning off. I don't have to tell it to get the snow and the ice off of my driveway in New England winter so that I don't have to go have a heart attack at 75 years old. How far away from experiment and decision making to actual, here's a consumer product that can go do that, do you think, are we? For some of the yeah. low hanging fruit. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, I would say one of the challenge problems of that type that motivates a lot of robotics researchers would be able to, have, it would be the intelligent home assistant. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. An assistive robot that could navigate and help you out in your home permitting you to kind of age in place, permitting uh, people to, to be, you know, better enabled who might have disabilities, being able to navigate all of the clutter um, that exists in a typical home and, right. and deal with all of the different uh, complexities of that environment, having to go up and down stairs, having to deal with moving furniture and having to deal with your, you know, cats and dogs. Right. Uh, so, so I think cleaning robots are actually a really good glimpse into. Man, I need one of those. That. I know, I, yeah, I, I know there are limitations, but actually it's, it's pretty remarkable how much more intelligent they've become uh, yeah. in the last couple of decades that rather than just kind of randomly zipping around and bumping into walls, they now are building maps of your home. They're right. using state-of-the-art navigation technologies to optimally clean your home. So, right. so not only do they have a map, but they're taking the optimal paths to clean your home with all of the modeled obstacles that they've detected. Yeah. And they're also sharing all that information and trying to optimize what they're doing based on how this is going in everyone's homes. So yeah. um, they've come a long way, even though I, I'll admit I have a dog and I, yeah. I've given up on cleaning robots for the same reason. Uh, they're not intelligent enough yet to outsmart your pet, but right. um, it's come a long way and it's continuing to, to evolve. Well, I love this part of the conversation. This is the fun part of the conversation and we'll wrap it up here in a second because it's the very positive stuff. The that sometimes the scarier, the other side of the conversation, uh, I have some folks coming on to talk about this is, yeah, that's great, but what happens if that data is hacked? And, and so um, we've got a cybersecurity guy coming on and, and he, you know, by, by definition, they're kind of glass half empty folks. Yes, it's great that you get that ability, but if that somehow that data is accessed and your, um, your robot, not so much that anything with the with the machine. It's more, oh, so now I know the layout of your home, and by knowing the layout of your home and where chairs are and the bar stools moved or these things are happening, I know who's in the home. It, it could be extrapolated, or when you're home and when you're out, and then what could I do with that nefarious data? And it just feels like, on the one hand, we get the benefit, which I'm all for, um, but if we don't bring in real governance and controls behind them, no different than a ring phone or other devices, um, you know, the the camera and the microphone on your Xbox that's in your house that nobody thinks about. And if you don't disable it or pay attention to it, you can make yourself vulnerable and on and on and on down the list. I'm not just trying to pick on those devices, but it's, um, it's part of that IoT world where uh, you get great opportunity, but you also can create vulnerability if you're not, um, you know, not just hooking things up. You've really got to be on top of it. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, there are great benefits to everything being networked, but at the same time, vulnerabilities that go along with it. You know, there's kind of the long term dream of eventually eliminating traffic congestion by having every vehicle be networked so that they can cooperate and they all end up driving at the optimal speed and there's no traffic jams ever again. But at the same time, you know, uh, having them all networked. Uh, opens them up to vulnerabilities and, and potentially being being weaponized uh, right. and, and you know harm being done. So um, I agree that we have to be aware of both sides of that issue. Right. And we've been giving away so much data as we've embraced uh, intelligent uh, assistance in our home. Maybe not, not everyone has robots in their home yet, but as we embrace that technology, it's filming us, it's recording us. We're giving it lots of data, personal information, and. Right. Um, there also needs to be a lot of regulation and governance of what gets done with that. And, and probably we're going to have to learn from mistakes that continue to happen to, to do a better job of that. All right. Last question, um, or maybe second to last question. When do you think we'll have robots among us, which is a crazy prediction. I know nobody's going to hold you again. And I don't mean like I've seen robots being developed to help sh um, herd 
animals in New Zealand and in Australia or clean ship holes or sort of on the periphery. I mean, we're walking down the road and we don't even notice the street sweeper or the garbage collector or the maintenance person up, uh, you know, doing uh, window cleaning and there, and it's just machines. And, and I don't mean an, just an automated scaffold. I mean, it assembles itself, it goes up, it does its job, it puts its things away, hops in its autonomous vehicle, or it is the autonomous vehicle, and away it goes. When do you think, at least in the initial stages, we're going to see the regular activity of devices moving among us, and it's not going to be particularly a novelty? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, I, you know, I think it's, to some degree, it's driven by economic factors as well. Like, will there come a point where you can get a humanoid robot out to a construction site and have them perform work at lower cost than a person can. Um, you know, that, depending on what part of the world you're in, there might be more or less of an interest in that. One, right. Actually, one area where we've tended to see that attitude be embraced a bit more widely is Japan, where they're more of the mindset that, oh, yeah, all of the workers in the kitchen of a restaurant should be robots. Of course, why not? You know, but... Right. Um, I guess unless, unless you're a worker in the kitchen, then you're like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. What about me? Yeah. So there I guess this the answer to that question kind of fits in with the fact that there is going to be some economic disruption, I guess, as this technology evolves. Right. It's going to dis displace some jobs, but it's also going to create new jobs. Right. It's going to change the way that we interact with machines. It's going to create a lot of opportunities to continue uh, governing what they do, orchestrating what they do. Um, but there is there is probably a wave of economic disruption where the way we work changes, the way machines help us changes, and you know I, I think it's going to hit us and pass over us and have cha you know change the way that we work probably over the course of the next fifty years or so. Fifty years. That's your. That feels like a. That's an interesting number. I'm, I, I I'm, say I say that number because you're you're talking about like humanoids, you know, performing the the, the most complex tasks that people perform today, as yeah. opposed to just you know a cleaning robot driving around your home. Well, I don't know if I mean C three PO or R two D two, but but you know something where we would say. Um, here's the example uh, that I'm imagining. Not a great example, but. I remember early days in my in my reading of the history of early days of automobiles, it was a novelty. Um, there were many demonstrations of the value of um, a internal combustion engine plowing a field, and there just wasn't a lot of adaptation. One, the cost; it was perceived to be very complex. How do I refuel it? Where it just in all these ways. And these horses, I've been doing these horses or these mules for millennia. I, I got them. And then Mr. Ford created his assembly line and, you know, Katie bar the door three years later, five years later, you could get any kind you wanted as long as it was in black and it was a three speed and had three horsepower. And, and it was such a seismic change that the roads caught up, the asphalt caught up, the painting caught up, the laws and licenses caught up. They all caught up to the technology because everybody had one, kind of like drones. Everybody, a bunch of people went and got drones, and now the laws are catching up on what does that imply for privacy and all these other things. But it was, um, um, you know, M Mr. Ford said, man, if I can make this cheap enough and easy enough, who knows what applications this thing would be applied to? He imagined a bunch of them. And I'm, I'm just curious, when do we think the equivalent of that um, – Breakthrough is affordable to the common people. It accomplished, uh, it made their life easier, almost like a personal assistant that you were talking about before. It wasn't particularly niched. And I'm sure in the beginning it was hard. Who knew how to fix these things, right? There were no schools on it. People just jumped in, but uh, it created a whole new industry. So I don't know. I don't know that it's easy to predict, but I'm curious to see when we can see them at least in the introductory level among us. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd say one interesting case study that maybe you could extrapolate from is what's happened with aerial drones, you know, to the point they've now become so cheap. Uh, anybody can get one. I have Anyone one, yeah. can put a camera filming any location that they want. And we've really had to regulate them and come up with a lot of new rules about their safe use. Uh, right. 
be, being based in the New York metro area, I'm particularly aware of this because of the rare circumstances in which you see a drone getting right. flown around around New York City. Right. Um, but it, it was really a rapid evolution of the technology. The cost dropped dramatically as it became more widely widely adopted. So, you know, right. it, it could it could come rapidly. Uh, right. it, it certainly seems to have with uh, aerial drones. Right. Well, Dr. Englott, thank you very much for coming on. It's uh, it's a great conversation. If people want to learn more about your work, what you do and your research, how can they find you? Well, uh, I have a fairly unique name. So if you <laughs> search it, you'll find my website pretty much okay. on the first hit okay. where we have videos, all of our recent papers, and we have some code as well. Um, okay. We're you know, believers in putting our work out there, sharing it with others, letting letting others take it for a test drive. And uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to check out our, our research website. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate you coming on. I look forward to uh, our next conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. My great pleasure. And if you've enjoyed the show today, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. We'll see you next time on the QTS Experience. See you, everybody.